हेलो हाय गुड इवनिंग दिस इज मी रत्नश्री एंड प्रिया हसन वी आर बोथ इन द पब्लिक आउटरीच कमिटी एस्ट्रोनॉमिकल सोसाइटी ऑफ इंडिया वेयर द मीटिंग इज ऑन गोइंग करेंटली एंड एक्साइटिंग एस्ट्रोनॉमिकल प्रेजेंटेशन आर बींग मेड कटिंग एज वर्क फ्रॉम दिस इयर and uh, so we are trying to bring you that yeah uh, so this yeah so this session we are having specifically for students for undergraduate postgraduate students who are new to the subject and therefore what we've got for you is that we have uh, often many of these cases are students uh, are the speakers itself as well as research scholars who are going to explain to you the the things that happened during the day the important talks that happened and what were the results and what was the exciting science that people presented in the day in a simple manner so that will be easy for all of you to understand and we hope you enjoy do, this yeah do keep in mind though that this is uh, this is going to be a very partial coverage of all the excitements given the, the shortness of time that we are using so but over the next year we will try to bring you many of the excitements in full talks and uh, uh, we start with magnetic fields magnetic fields that are uh, found um, i mean magnetic fields are ubiquitous everywhere in the universe we find them but in particular with stars so uh, we have uh, with us um, today punam chandra uh, professor punam chandra from uh, um, the nation center for radio astrophysics and uh, punam you have uh, had uh, you have uh, been having very exciting observations related to the magnetic fields uh, using the gmrt and many other cutting edge telescopes right and uh, you you uh, you would say that there are some stars which have kind of anomalously large magnetic fields is that so you tell us a little bit about where magnetic fields are found and what it implies yes uh course i would love to tell that and i am going to then uh, bring up my screen just to explain yes. it slightly better yes and, yes uh, so i would again i would start with this slide and why to give you a, a little feel of why do we want to talk about these stars because massive stars in our universe are the most exotic stars which explode as one of the biggest explosions in the universe and some of us we may have heard in recent past about they are supernovae gamma ray bursts uh, and gravitational wave short gamma ray burst and sometimes past radio bursts so it is very important to understand how these massive stars will evolve and they will give these at the time of their death now of course one of the thing which has to be most important in stars is their mass but what we don't realize that there are other things also which become very important like rotation mass loss rate whether they are in a binary system what is the metallicity of the medium uh, in which these stars are formed but there is one aspect which very few people talk about and that is magnetism in massive stars and people have very good reason to talk about this uh, not talk about this magnetism because if you study stellar physics it is very in, easy to generate magnetic field if the envelope of a st star is convective for example like stars like our sun but massive stars do not have convective envelope they have something which is called radiative en envelope means photons transfer energy there are no convective mass motions of the gas which will generate magnetic field so it is very difficult or it is not people thought it is not possible to have magnetic field in massive stars but it turns out that when people do surveys they find out that the sum of the massive stars which are around 10% of the total massive stars they will have this very beautiful very simple very large scale dipolar magnetic fields which will be of the order of kilo gauss and they will be extending much much farther away from the magnetic field now it is very intuitive to think about that if a star is evolving it will have a certain evolutionary path but if a star which has a magnetic field and if it is evolving it it will have a very different evolutionary path and let me just tell you that these evolutionary path can be very different and they can explain some of the biggest mysteries in the in our universe and some of them are very very relevant in current time 
so that is what i wanted to just bring up on the magnetic field ratna yeah and you were also talking about uh, mass loss from stars and uh, over a, over its lifetime uh, there is um, this mass being lost from the star and you are also i think perhaps considering whether there's a possibility there are it's varies over at the lifetime and so on and the effect of the magnetic field on this mass loss this is also something you are considering yes yes very true and let me just say the following if you imagine again very intuitively if a, mass, a star is very big very massive it is going to be a very big star and what happens inside the star nuclear fusion is happening nuclear fusion is generating this pressure which is going outwards and that is what is keeping a star stable if it was not there imagine a star would just collapse under its own gravity there is nothing to stop that gravitational force what happens in massive stars is that they are so big that outermost layer of the stars are not that nicely gravitationally bound and nuclear fusion is happening at a very high speed so this star keeps on losing the mass some of its mass from its outermost layer but what happens if a star has magnetic field this plasma the the mass of the star this plasma starts to follow this magnetic field lines as you can see on the left side of the curve or in the 3d on the right side of the curve and then this plasma or this star material which was to be lost from the star comes back on the star and it is not able to lose uh, get out of the star so that is what it is i'm saying mass loss quenching now the thing is uh, the very exciting part of this whole aspect is that when a star explodes as a supernova or gamma ray burst it leaves a stellar remnant and that is either a neutron star or a black hole this is what our understanding is and with this huge mass loss it is not possible to create a very big black hole uh, but with in ligo what we are seeing is that many of these black holes are a very massive black holes and it is not possible to explain these black holes with a current stellar evolutionary model with the regular mass loss rate so what people have scientists have done some simulations and they have seen that if you have this magnetic fields there can be two things one can, which can happen one they can have a bigger mass star so when a black hole will be formed it can be a bigger black hole which can solve this mystery of bigger black holes seen in the ligo other aspect which could happen is that these stars which have magnetic field when they explode and make a neutron star at the center this neutron star is likely to have a very big mass, massive big magnetic huge magnetic field and this is exactly what a concept of magnetar is and these magnetars in some cases are considered to be uh, the uh, ones which are making fast radio bursts so it these magnetic stars have potential to solve at least two of the biggest mysteries lingering currently in astronomy yeah uh, it, it's actually very interesting how the, these kinds of connections uh, the magnetic fields or i mean their accelerating particle charge you kind of see it in across the spectrum of all kinds of objects so many of these similarities and i somehow found that very i thought that it will be of interest also to young people who are interested in astronomy and uh, uh, so in these like uh, the magnetic fields which have been found some stars have been found to have this and some no and uh, so and then those which have been found i mean it's, it's it is a mystery i guess why they have and why some of the others don't have and uh, also some maybe inter interesting patterns that you may be finding in when you are looking at these like when stars which are in binaries and then what do we see about their magnetic fields what are the patterns etc so you wanted to say something about that <laughs> i can i can certainly tell you that and again i will bring myself into the full uh, slide show mode so what i want to say is the following of course since there is magnetic field this magnetic field is going to have some implications and those implications are the one we are trying to understand with various telescopes and trying to see how these magnetic fields are generated right now there are two two groups of scientists one group of scientists believe that these magnetic fields can be generated from the raw material from which the star is formed for example the clouds from which the star is formed if the cloud has slightly higher magnetic field for some reason 
then this when this cloud will make a, a star it this star will have a magnetic field so this is one uh, group of scientists who believe other group of scientists believe that since these massive stars are all formed in group many of these stars will be having companions and when two big stars come come together in that because of the differential rotation different speeds of the rotation of the two star you can generate the magnetic field so there is a clash so what we are trying to do we are trying to understand the we are trying to understand how this magnetic field will ma manifest in various uh, electromagnetic uh, bands and how we can try to understand this magnetic field and that's where our studies come into play so we are doing this study of some of the, these magnetic stars with upgraded giant meter wave radio telescope the radio telescope which is near pune and is one of the largest telescope at low frequencies in the world so what happens because of this magnetic field uh, around this polar region there will be a very special kind of radiation which will be generated and it is called a coherent radiation or to be more precise it is called electron cyclotron radiation uh, uh, radio uh, electron cyclotron laser emission the way this radiation is generated this is 100% circularly polarized and physics dictates that it should be generated above the pole in this circle uh, this auroral circle is what we call but since the star is rotating at a different axis it is like a lighthouse effect we will only see when this radiation will come into our line of sight so if you see this right plot this radiation will come into our line of sight only at two times at two phases of this star once when one will be coming once it will be coming from you know uh, a, a a pair of radiation will come as the star is making one full rotation once from north pole south pole then from south pole north pole so you are only going to see this directional radiation only for a very small phase of the star another very interesting property of this radiation is that uh, if you do it at different frequencies the higher frequency radiation will come closer to the star lower frequency will come further from the star lower frequency will come further away from the star so it means you are able to create by observing at different frequencies in some way a 3d magnetic topology of the star and this kind of study will then can throw light on the origin of the magnetic field so this is the plot i am showing the radiation how the, your, this is your eye on the left plot and how your eyes are looking at this radiation you will only see at two phases of this star and then uh, you know this is how this radiation so it is very important to observe it at those particular phases but what is even more interesting is that i was talking about the single magnetic star but some of these stars are in a binary system they have a companion what is very interesting is that out of almost a dozen such system in almost all cases but one one of the star is uh, has magnetic field the other doesn't have a magnetic field there is only one system which i'm uh, showing on the right where both the stars are magnetic this is a big mystery how is it possible that this the stars are formed from the same cloud one star got to have a magnetic field the other did not get to have a magnetic field and this is a mystery we are trying to understand in the binary system and that also tells us that if the magnetic field probably did not come from these clouds otherwise both stars would have gotten it but there is also possible that there are two channels of magnetic field generation because the star which we saw where both stars are magnetic field it could have come from the cloud so maybe there are certain kind of systems where these interstellar clouds are generating magnetic field but in other so others they are not they are probably coming from some other mechanism so that's why these binary stars are very very exciting to study if they have magnetic field uh thanks punam and once again uh, how how ubiquitous it is that we have these kind of scenarios of the lighthouse effect or the radius to frequency mapping in so many instances we have this so that's somehow in a way that's very inspiring thanks punam so much uh, um yes uh, so there are um, okay uh, yeah uh, shriharsh has also joined us who is going to talk about fast radio bus now and uh, the meanwhile i just want to... there is a question yeah 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 punam okay. please go ahead 
Uh. I just wanted to say that I just want to bring out the excitement of this field in just uh, 30 seconds. And what I want to say is that the first such star with magnetic field was seen in the year 2000. After that, for 15 years, there was no second star until we started looking for it with the GMRT. And then when we saw the second one after 15 years, we did not believe that we have seen this kind of radiation because it is like you know there's nothing. But then when we observed it and we carried out the analysis, it was true. And then when we carried out the survey of more stars, in in two years we told, there are six more stars. Such stars are known, and half of them are discovered only with the GMRT. But other half were discovered with other telescopes because people all around the world got interested in this field when they saw the second one, and they also started observing. So this is. at the excitement of the field and which is just taken it to a next uh, stage mm -hmm. altogether and uh, the question which arvin paranj bhai has um, about polarization and in particular circular polar once again this is something which is also very ubiquitous we encounter it in so many instances but not in all we encounter it in instances where there is something to constrain the radiation to be polarized and in fact it works exactly. as a very nice detective tool and exactly. uh, so so the polarization being that uh, i mean the radiation that is coming towards us in the perpendicular plane if there is some kind of constraint not to be in all of the plane but in parts of the plane that's exactly. polarization and as it is coming towards us if the uh, vector electric magnetic field vector is kind of making a kind of a circular uh that would be circular yeah, for current understanding is, if no. the radiation coming to us is rotating anti clockwise we call it right circular polarization if it is rotating clockwise then we call it oh, left oh, circular oh, polarization oh. so these are the definition of polarization she has um, uh, will you uh, come in with uh, your uh, could you switch on your uh, uh -huh, great so uh, sri hash uh, tendulkar from tif um, mumbai and he is going to take walk us through the very exciting um, fields of fast radio bus so sri hash if you could uh, start with telling the viewers what are fast radio bus and also what uh, has uh, made one uh, think that they are at cosmological distances Definitely. and then tell us your work please sure yeah Uh, let me see if I. Uh, this is the first time I'm using yeah. uh, streaming. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. there is a there is a share button. If you mm -hmm. click on that, and then it allows you to share either uh, I mean an application or. Uh, I see. Uh, the full screen. So. Ha. Huh, or your whole screen, or a Chrome window, or something like that. And, okay. So, uh, so you. Uh, let me see. Yeah, yeah, it's coming. Yeah. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, Shri Harsh, when you are there in full screen, you may not be able to see the studio or any of the. Uh, but we are. You will be able to hear us. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. So. Uh, yes, yes. That sounds good. Okay. So just to be uh, clear, I'm pro, uh, I'm faculty member at TFR uh, Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics, and I'm also uh, a faculty member at Na the National Center for Radio Astrophysics. I'm jointly posted, uh, so I do work both with uh, TFR as well as NCRA. Uh, and we, we are we are uh, kind of asking you a very I mean it's it's a tall order, but 15 minutes tell us. the excitement so fast sure, radio bus absolutely okay so um, i'm going to talk, tell first about you know fast radio bus what we know of them and uh, towards the end i'm going to talk about um, what we are doing currently to uh, understand them and how students and postdocs can can get involved because that's primarily the primarily the audience here and you'll notice that i have uh, kept some of my slides i'm going to breeze through some of them because i spoke about them in my previous uh talk but i've kept them in so that if there are questions we can come back to those and i can use those as visuals so fast radio bursts are these extremely bright bursts or flashes of light that uh seem to be coming from random directions in the sky uh, and you would see them with your eyes if your eyes were sensitive to radio light uh, but our eyes are not sensitive to radio light but so we have to build telescopes which can uh, see these 
So this animation is showing what it would look like if your eyes could see radios. You'll just see bright flashes of light, light coming from random directions in the sky. And there are a lot of them every day. There are about a thousand of them every day in the entire sky at uh, brightnesses that are detectable by our current telescopes. If you build a more sensitive telescope, there might be even 100,000 of these every day in the entire sky. So we know that they are coming from halfway across the universe because of something called dispersion. OK, so this is a part where uh, a bit of the physics becomes involved. And so I'm going to spend a little time here. So this is what a fast radio burst looks like. Uh, can you see my mouse, by the way? Uh, Could you move it you a my little? Mouse? Uh, my eyesight is not too good. Poonam, are you able to see it? I can't okay. see the mouse. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, can't see the fine. mouse. Yeah. yeah, so the plot here shows the uh, shows an FRB coming through radio data. It's a dynamic spectrum. So every color point indicates the intensity at a given frequency uh, on the vertical axis from 1200 megahertz to 1500 megahertz. And uh, time on the horizontal axis. So you can think of frequency channel as a radio station. So you have you know, the FM band going from 88 megahertz to 110 megahertz. And then you have Radio Mirchi at some frequency, Radio City and uh, All India Radio at different frequencies. And so what, you're ha what you have is this signal comes first at high, fre high frequencies. And then it arrives later and later at lower frequencies. And this is a very well understood effect because radio light, as it travels through uh, plasma, which is mostly electrons and protons in the interstellar medium, uh, interacts with the electrons. And at higher frequencies, the electrons, because they have inertia, they don't move as much. And so the radio high frequencies go as if they are, the electrons are not there. But the lower frequencies get slowed down as if they are going through molasses. right? So this, this is well understood. And the arrival time goes very precisely as frequency to the minus 2. Okay. Uh, unless uh, for low low density uh, interstellar medium. And the proportionality constant, the total magnitude of this effect, so the time delay from high, high frequency to low frequency, is proportional to what is called the dispersion measure, or the total number of electrons that uh, the radio wave interacts with when you, when you go from the source to the observer. So the, that is shown by this equation here. It is the integral of electron density along uh, the line of sight from the source to the observer. So because of this dispersion thing, it is extremely computationally expensive to find an FRB. If you simply try to find an FRB, uh, you can't detect it. So if you take a, ra a radio telescope and you just add, add up the intensities at different frequencies in a straight line, you will not find it. So you have to search for different dispersion measures. So what you do is you assume a dispersion measure you correct for all of this. So by that, I mean that you're shifting these channels so that the pulse, uh, the hypothetical pulse lines up. Then you add all the frequencies, all the intensity at different frequencies together. And you find a single time profile, which you can see in the top. You have this flux as a function of time. And only if you have the correct dispersion measure, you'll find a, a pulse there. right? So you have to try this for a lot of different dispersion measures. And that makes it extremely computationally expensive. And that is why we had to we had to spend a lot of computer time trying to find these FRBs. And that is why we had to, uh, it had to be until about 14 years ago that we found the first FRB, despite pulsars being discovered 50 years ago. We were simply not searching for FRBs at higher dispersion measures because we didn't have the computational power to do that. Uh, now, given that this uh, dispersion measure is a integral of along the distance, if you have some idea of the electron density, it can be a proxy for distance itself. So after you subtract what the Milky Way can contribute, you can find out how much, how far the FRB has to be. Right? So this is the electron distribution in the Milky Way. We have idea about what the electron density is like at different in different spiral arms and in different distances from the galactic center uh, based on different observations from uh, atomic hydrogen to uh, H alpha observations and things like that. So the galactic center is the point at 0, 0, and we are at a location about 8 kiloparsecs in the y direction. So if you tell me that there is a line of sight along this direction, you can integrate this electron density to the edge of the Milky Way, and you can find out that this much, uh, these many electrons 
the uh, is the maximum that the radio wave can uh, interact with when it passes through the milky way uh, along that direction and what we see for frbs which are these uh, red spots on the in the right hand side plot is that their uh, dispersion measure is far higher than what the milky way can contribute which is this uh, sort of uh, exponential exponentially decreasing envelope of red of blue points on the on the right so what what is being shown on the uh, right hand side plot is the dispersion measure of different sources the blue blue spots are pulsars which are in our own galaxy and the red spots are uh, frbs and uh, on the horizontal axis is the lat galactic latitude so minus 90 is uh, the galactic south pole zero is the ga galactic equator and plus 90 is the galactic north pole so you can see that the dispersion measure contribution is high along the equator which is because most of the gas in the milky way and the stars and everything are along the disk right so that's uh, along the galactic latitude of zero and then towards the poles there is there is very little thing so what you can see is that this difference between the red points and the blue points is uh, not explained by uh, that cannot be explained other than by the intergalactic medium contribution so what you need is extra electrons to explain this higher dm and to get those get all of those electrons you have to go far far away uh, from the galaxy so you have to go past uh, for about a few gigaparsec to make sure that you can get, get all of those electrons so the other way we know that these are extra galactic is that we have been able to localize very few of them uh, to their host galaxies and we can precisely identify uh, the distances to these galaxies using other measures so we measure the redshift and you can find out how far uh, they're coming from so with this we are able to confirm that they're coming from uh, cosmological distances where are we in terms of understanding what they are yes we are we are basically nowhere so let me come to that so at these distances uh, let, let me talk about um, this part later so let me ask, answer your questions at these distances for frbs to be visible to us uh, they have to be incredibly luminous so they have, there has to be a lot of intrinsic energy and uh, they're, they're very short time scales and you have to emit a lot of energy in that short time scale so you necessarily have to have coherent emission okay and uh, to produce that coherent emission uh, to store that energy you need absolutely need a strong magnetic field so let me talk a little bit about uh, the energetics so you have a millisecond time scale so these bursts last only for a thousandth of a second and uh, what typically happens is that you know light travel the speed of uh, light is the limiting uh, speed also for information to travel from one side to the other so if one atom decides to emit for it to, for something to emit coherently that information that this atom has started emitting has to reach the other side and that is limited by its size so if you have an object of some size s it cannot emit uh, bursts or which are shorter than the time scale of c delta t right so where, where delta t is s, uh, s by c so one millisecond corresponds to about 300 kilometers in size and which necessarily means that these objects have to be smaller than uh, 300 kilometers so the new the typical objects that you would think of for this are neutron stars or black holes even white dwarfs are 10,000 kilometers in size mm -hmm. right two minutes two minutes yeah. sure uh, i'm going pretty slow okay so the other part is that you, because you need to pack enormous amounts of energy in this small size uh, you basically need a very strong magnetic field and that is the only feasible reservoir so let me skip all of this and talk about uh, different new different models there are a lot of different models for frbs most of them involve neutron stars or magnetars where magnetars are uh, neutron stars with extremely strong magnetic fields and those are what we think uh, are contributing at least some of these frbs so i'm going to skip over a bunch of these things i'm going to keep these slides so that uh, we can answer questions later but I'm going to talk a little bit about CHIME, which is a radio telescope which we uh, built over the past four years in uh, British Columbia and Canada. This is our team 
uh, not the complete team, but most of them. And you can see a lot of young faces in there. We actually built the telescope and the electronics and uh, software algorithms which uh, work for this telescope. But this telescope has a huge field of view to find FRBs. So you can see that some of the older telescopes like Parks and Aristibo look at very small parts of the sky. So you, the probability of detecting an FRB is very small. So to detect a lot of FRBs, you need to cover huge swaths of the sky simultaneously. And that is what Chime does. And we detect a lot of FRBs with it. Uh, let me go to the data analysis part of it. To find FRBs, you need to do a lot of data analysis. And so we spent most of the three years actually writing software, which can process 130 gigabits of data per second in real time. That's a lot of data, so you can't store it. So you have to go through a lot of process processing right there and then to figure out whether something is real or not, whether something is a real FRB or not. And then you save that data, and then you can process it offline. So we have a lot of computing power. This is our Chime FRB backend, which has 130 nodes and about 17 terabytes of RAM, which can store this buffer this data for about five minutes. So I won't talk about the results right now. You can go back to the previous talk. But uh, let me come to what you need to need uh, in order to work on FRB. So this might be relevant for the students here. Uh, on the theory side, you really need, if you want to work on FRB theory, you really need a good background in plasma physics and electrodynamics and relativity. On the experimental side, uh, because FRBs are so new, most of uh, very little software has been written to actually characterize FRBs. In some of the older fields, the telescopes come with ready-made software, which you can use to do this. But now we are writing our own programs to do uh, to analyze the data. and so. Strong programming skills and data analysis skills are quite a must. Machine learning and AI is something that is useful, but only after you know, having strong fundamentals in data analysis. And in the, on the instrumentation side, again, you need expertise in analog and dig or digital electronics, FPGA programming, and signal processing. With that, I'll stop, uh, Ratnashree. Yeah, yeah. And we are going to have a full-fledged talk at some time. This is such an exciting yeah. topic. And uh, I'm happy to give a talk. This is, I'm sorry, this is so right. We'll do that. Uh, yeah, no, actually, we also are putting a demand of it being very short. Sorry about that. But we'll have a full-fledged talk. I don't see questions right now. I'm going to call in uh, uh, Gunjan and uh, Manami uh, and uh, Srihar, if um, uh, you'd like to stay on for some time and make our discussions interactive that would be nice and uh, but whenever you need to leave uh that's also i mean uh, there is the uh, you said you are new to this right there is the leave studio button at the bottom whenever you'd like to leave but if you'd like to stay on and make it make the next session interactive that would also be nice and uh gunjan manami both of you are in no i see uh manami is also in and uh, when you, if you would like to share your screen, uh, you just click on the share button. Uh, Ashwin has also come. And have I added Ashwin in? And so if you, or if you, do you want to discuss or do you want to also use any visuals? And uh, you tell the, the uh, tell uh, the participants where uh, you are uh, from and also what you're talking about and the given that the shortage of time okay we have started a little late for your session so 15 minutes yeah sure yeah. Okay. so uh, we've been discussing a lot about uh, magnetic field so far it's been a magnetic field fiesta over the last couple of days and even uh, professor punam had mentioned about magnetic fields and massive stars so uh, I, I think this part of our discussion would be on you know magnetic fields of neutron stars in particular and we've uh, we are seeing uh, in, the, in yesterday's session we discussed a lot about you know, a variety of neutron star systems. Um, hello. I can hear you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I hope my internet is not acting up. No, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. So yeah, we've been discussing about a variety of neutron star systems, and we've talked about uh, magnetars. Manonita had discussed yesterday, and uh, magnetars are neutron stars with uh, you know extremely high magnetic fields. And uh, there are also uh, discussions about you know coherent radio emissions from uh, pulsars. Pulsars are uh, fast spinning I mean, neutron stars which are emitting in radio, 
we see radio pulses from them and we had brief discussion on accretion powered x-ray pulsars and uh, also using of uh, using the x-ray pulse i mean using the pulsars for you know uh, identifying gravitational waves i mean how uh, these are the broad things so i think i'll uh, let gunjan you know take it a little further uh, from here about uh, the emission from uh, pulsars and what the uh, talk on uh, coherent pulsar emission was about so what what do you uh, what do you take away from that talk particularly yeah so as we know that uh, the magnetic fields like there are strong magnetic fields at the poles of the neutron stars and uh, when a neutron star collapses it's so dense that it starts spinning so we have a rotation and the magnetic field lines and this uh, this makes the electric field act accelerates the plasma the plasma that contains electron the charged particles basically uh, accelerates them and when they move around like uh, the magnetic field lines they emit radiation and because the magnetic axis of uh, the pulsars they do not align with the rotation axis we see beaming and that's why the pulse profile we, we call it pulses and i think even uh, for the gravitational wave they talked about millisecond pulsars how they use it to make a set of uh, some pulsars like a pulsar timing array which can help us detect a nanohertz gravitational wave so basically and it is exciting like uh, we see telescopes detecting photons which is a direct uh evidence but gravitational wave is like a ripple in the space time so and what happens it, is uh, i think gunjan is trying to say is you have these pulsars which are spinning at a certain rate and they are extremely precise clocks and uh, you know the way gps works here is we have three atomic clocks out in space and then you get the time from different clocks and you see you know use those times to de- determine where you are on the ground so because pulsars are precise you know the spin at a fixed frequency but they slow down also but we know exactly how much they slow down so you can use this to identify positions in space so when gravitational waves passes through these things they bend the space time now if you you would know this if you uh, you know look at your gps you need to take into account the gravitational effects on uh, your clock if a person sitting is on, on the ground he his clock will Uh, you know tick slower than a person sitting out of the uh, you know a gravitational field of the earth so there are uh, effects where the if you watch inter- if you watch the movie interstellar you'll see sitting near a black hole makes your you know age much slower the person sitting far away you know age is much faster than the person here so these are the effects that we need to take into account and gravitational waves cause shift in the you know arrival times of the pulses from these precise pulsars so if you know how much they get shifted by you can use them to detect gravitational waves and i think in gmrt we used i mean the the, the calibrations have been done to uh, essentially make this much more precise and help identify mm-hmm. and uh, it, the second it, yeah it's yes, funny ma'am. that i mean with the pulsars we know why they pulse and why they radiate there are so many theories but we don't have the definitive theory Correct. but they are so useful oh my god i know <laughs> yeah, uh, in I fact mean, uh, <laughs> the the next uh, one of the discussions we had about uh, this was giving a theory of radio emission we don't exactly know why uh, the these radio pulsations yes. are happening uh, we are there giving... had a yes uh, presentation right. so uh, the, the, there was one why, idea so why the basic correct one idea is that you know when charged particles are in a magnetic field they accelerate and accelerating charged particles radiate this is a fundamental idea so the particles going along the field lines they emit curvature radiation because the magnetic field lines are curved so when the pulsar rotates about an axis there there's a rotation axis and the magnetic axis when it rotates about that you start seeing pulses beaming towards us and this is in emitted in radio and uh, these are the pulses and there were some uh, like you're suggesting ma'am there are so many theories that are coming about one such theory was also put across yesterday yes, to trying yes, to explain yes. this because of yes, how complicated yes uh, yes 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 curvature yeah. yes. so, curvature radiation yeah. from bunches and the details coherence they radiation they're coming ah, exactly like yeah. laser pulse yeah. the coherence is so high it's as if like you have uh, you know a laser light being sh- you know shine you shine laser light at something that's how uh, coherent uh, yeah. these pulsations yeah. are yes. from pulsars yes. and an attempt to explain why that is in radio and uh, uh, i think one other class of system that, and manami ha uh, ha yes please 
yeah yeah Good. yeah so you... other class that uh, he was uh, i think uh, ashwin had covered so i think he'll brief it better so that was accreting neutron stars so accreting yeah. pulsars so and also that yeah. basically uh, by maintaining the decay in the magnetic field it still keeps uh, the spin down rate i think quite it does not let it go down if i'm saying it correctly yeah so the interesting thing is in a isolated neutron star it spins down it always spins down but in yeah, an accreting neutron star you have a higher star, spin you, down rate i would believe no no in a you can have a higher spin down rate you can also <laughs> have a spin up you know this is the only time you can see yeah. a neutron which is slowed down go back up spin back up mm -hmm. it's like you know you're going in a merry go round somebody comes with a higher velocity and hits you there and then you start spinning out faster okay. so that sort of a thing happens here so i thought i'll show a few slides about uh, that yeah so, so you will have to it. share your screen i i will i will uh, try to share mine and i'll screen. add it in the studio and one second okay so, so one you minute. were so, talking uh, about uh, yeah they are spinning up when angular momentum is being transferred from some binary companion other way they may spin up is when there are glitches Somewhat, I mean, uh, yes, uh, glitches are uh, correct. That's another, uh, uh, another another apple and orange, of course, another word <laughs> thing altogether. But yes. let's, uh, yeah, Can let me see if you are, uh, yeah, 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 your your uh, screen share has come in. I'm Go ahead. This, uh, Go ahead. X-ray binaries and neutrons are this uh, flow chart, right? I'm not able to see you, so. Uh... Yeah, yeah. So we are able to see it. You can go ahead. Okay. So I, I mean I think a quick uh, you know run, run through about uh, X-ray binaries are you know uh, neutron stars if you they produce uh, you know radiation in uh, radio waves that we uh, detect as pulsations and if uh, at some times in their magnetars isolated neutron stars can also produce X-rays when the magnetic field you know deconnection and this like one another discussed yesterday mm -hmm. they also produce uh, uh, X-ray radiation but what about you know neutron stars with slightly lower magnetic field strength. Then magnetars. Magnetars are extremely high, 10 power 14 Gauss magnetic fields. What about neutron stars with 10 power 9, 10, 11, 12 Gauss? So there, if you want to produce X-rays from these, uh, the process in which it is done is when there is a binary star, there's another main sequence star, a sun-like star or a slightly heavier star, along with the compact object, which is our neutron star. And then the ma matter is, you know, sucked by the neutron star. When matter falls onto neutron star, it accretes it. By accretion, it means, you know, the matter goes through the, you know, falls onto the surface of the neutron star, and then it is accelerated at a very high velocity. So when this accelerated that way, it radiates, you know, loses energy. Like if you drop a ball here, it will fall at a certain rate and it'll lose certain energy. But on a neutron star, these things can reach up to half the speed of light. The free fall velocities. So that is one method in which you know X rays are produced because it can uh, accelerate to such high extents. So uh, just to talk about you know the classification of uh, star binaries, you can have a compact object and uh, which is a black hole, for example, and a companion star. And uh, that in that case, you will have you know uh, if the companion star has a lower mass than the black hole, uh, the mass will flow across over the you know. Uh, potential and it will be pulled by the black hole and a disk will form accretion disk because there is a relative angular momentum between uh, these two objects. Of course, uh, if the companion star is more massive, it will not give up the mat material so easily. So the only way the, compa the compact object, a uh, black hole in this case, will accrete is through stellar winds when the star starts throwing winds away, just like you might have heard of solar wind, things like that. So in the case of neutron star, it is a very similar case where you have a low mass X-ray binary where the companion star it has a lower mass than my uh, neutron star. But in this case, what happens is that there is a magnetic field that comes into the picture, which means the accretion disk, when material starts spiraling in further in, it will not just reach the surface. The magnetic field will halt it at some distance. Okay, And that distance is called uh, what is known as the Alfvén radius. That is where the magnetic field will say, you know, you, I mean, you, you're, the pressure from the magnetic field will stop. It's like a guitar string. You can push it further, but not beyond a certain point. Then the, what happens is that the material in the accretion disk is plasma. It is These are charged particles. They get dragged along the field lines onto the poles of the neutron star, like this. And then accretion happens towards there. So the same case with a high mass X-ray binary also, where you have stellar winds that are shot at the neutron star, and the neutron stars uh, you know, form a disk and then accrete it. So uh, a subclass of the high mass X-ray binaries are something known as BE X-ray binary. So where the companion star is something known as a B-type star, and the uh, compact object is a neutron star, 
and this b x-ray binary the b type star has is rotating very fast so it forms a circumstellar disk so whenever the neutron star you know passes through the circumstellar disk it will accrete the matter and then you see a flaring up event so this particular source which uh, i am you know i have uh, worked on is core is a b x-ray binary now uh like we just previously discussed you will have a you know a neutron star which has this magnetic field and there is an accretion disk if the rotation axis is like this okay then the um, accreted material will go along until it reaches the field lines where at the alpha and radius and the matter will start flowing along the field lines on to the poles okay so this is uh, where all the matter will accumulate towards both the poles now because of the fact that the rotation axis is like this and the magnetic axis is like this and it's rotating like this if you observe from somewhere over here then you start seeing pulses you know once every time this comes now on the other hand if the rotation axis was like this and the magnetic axis was like this you would see both the poles coming towards you you know when this is rotating about this way so you see the pulse twice so you can already see that if you're looking at 0 to 2 pi rotation you can either see one pulse between 0 to 2 pi or you can see two pulses like in this case this is what is known as a pulse profile you know this is the average profile that you see when a, rot a neutron star spins between 0 to 2 pi we now need to yeah. conclude in about 2 yeah. minutes so i just say the uh, how we figure out the magnetic field of this uh, uh, you know uh, neutron star for example uh, what other ways we have of finding one we would in isolated neutron stars they spin down the rate at which they spinning down is what you can use to say that you know uh, this is a magnetic field strength the other way that we talk about magnetic field strength in uh, accretion power pulsars is something uh, using something on cyclotron lines so just like how you have an atom and uh, that has that's like a uh, you know hydrogen atom it's a it, there's a proton and then it has a certain potential and electrons form orbits around it quantized orbits so they will jump from one orbit to the other at a specific energy so you can figure out what the energy of that is using that so here you have cylindrically symmetric potential so electrons start forming landau levels like this so when you supply fixed amount of energy they'll jump from one orbit to other so using the energy at which that happens is how we figure out you know uh, that depends on your magnetic field strength it is directly related to magnetic field strength so uh, if you can see the cyclotron lines in your spectra then you'll be able to say okay this is a magnetic field strength near the neutron star mm -hmm. so uh, these are the you know concept core conceptual ideas behind uh, you know uh, the the beyond over using which the work was further uh, uh, taken ahead but uh, but i think I, this is gives the basic idea as what yeah. we observe observation we'll actually have a, a full full fledged talk in you know, in the coming year year we are going to follow up on some of these because here we have asked everyone to be so fast it's not really fair <laughs> we cannot go into <laughs> explain it there is a question and then we will move on to the next uh, discussions we are going to have arvin paranjpe um, Uh, he wants to know someone too young can you give some comparison of strength of magnetic field example how this field compare with say uh, my eyesight is not very good mri uh, right He's mri saying mri with mri yeah, yeah so uh, mri machine i think uh, will have extremely low Can magnetic Tesla's field also? yeah no, it is even lower yeah lower okay uh, mri yeah. will be of yeah. micro gauss or uh, you know okay, yeah. let me just probably But i so, myself have research. gone for mri so In the lab, it was written three <laughs> Tesla. Yeah, it might be on three. It Virenzi might be in uh, you were saying. Virendra, you were uh, saying something. Yeah, uh, I just uh, did a quick uh, Google search. It says one point five uh, Tesla. For MRI. That's the magnetic field in a MRI. MRI. So uh, the con conversion is, I think, ten power four Gauss is one Tesla. Right. Yes. And uh, in the case of a neutron star, I mean, in the case of Earth, it, 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 yeah, that's about point two to point six Gauss almost for Earth. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah if Earth you are looking at six a six neutron star, you'll have ten power eleven, twelve, thirteen Gauss. And one interesting oh, aspect yeah. being that even if you have such uh, smaller um, magnetic fields in, let's say, a star, uh, Sun, or larger star, when it is collapsing to a dense object, we have uh, this some. something called the flux conservation flux a kind of a yes. conservation yeah. principle which mm -hmm. is actually giving us a lot of magnetic field for the kind of 10 to the 10 gauss and 15 gauss and so on Correct. which we are seeing in objects like neutron stars 
and uh, so yeah okay uh, many factor large uh, arvind was saying perhaps it was about one of the terrestrial ones that we were discussing and uh, uh, so thanks arvind for all of those inputs and we will be moving to the next discussion which is uh, which was from the session on uh, sun solar system and yeah. somyaranjan dash and sushri you wanted to give us uh, inputs and uh, everyone else uh, please feel free to stay on and make it more interactive and uh, uh, if uh, either of you had some visuals you wanted to share there is a share mm -hmm. button and yes. share from that and we can add uh, visuals uh, into the discussion okay all right uh -huh. oh yeah arvin was saying that he wanted to know the factor right so if it was um, mm -hmm. so all more right. than like a trillion times something like that uh -huh. so where is, is the uh, is this come nay nee. Uh, Gunjan or uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, Sushri, you are sharing. All yeah. right, there is yeah. here. There uh, is here. Yeah. So when you are uh, in your presentation, you will not be able to see the studio, but you will hear us in yeah. case there is any problem. Yeah. We will let you know. Yeah. Please go yeah, ahead. Sure. Uh, can you see my slide? Uh, yeah, yeah. Fifteen minutes. Oh yeah, sure, sure. I'll be winding up. Yeah, in that. Minute. Okay. So. Uh, let's uh, narrow down to the discussion into a very our closest star uh, the sun so this uh, our discussion will be divided by me and somyaranjan so uh, i am a phd scholar at uh, prl and somya is from sesri kolkata so these three images uh, is of sun so first one is a solar eclipse so and the second one is the uh, simulation of the solar eclipse the field line around the sun so the coronal part we can see the uh, in the first image the darkest part is the moon which is occulting the sun and the, that white threads or uh, they are called the magnetic field lines from they are emerging out from the corona and which are extending to the interstellar medium and uh, the second part is the same magnetic field lines these uh, these colored field lines are the magnetic field lines and the third one is the multi wavelength image of sun so these multi wavelength multi channels are necessary why they are necessary already we had discussed in the yesterday's uh, talk, uh, in the discussion part so uh, just for comparison just for the completeness so this is how we small how are we small comparison to our own star which is uh, which is giving life to us so when i mean our day starts from the sun so uh, why the sun is important uh, why i mean we if we study the sun then what can help us uh, how we will come to know about the interesting nature of the universe where we are a very tiny 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 object so first of all what is the sun so this is these are some parameters like on earth we have some compositions we have atmosphere we have core so like here also uh, sun has its own atmosphere own core and if we can just uh, look at look at this cartoon so we can see uh, sun is a it has a core after that it has the radiation zone and after that the convection zone where the plasma bubbles are continuously uh, rising up and falling down like a bubbling of water so after that we have the photosphere which is the visible part that we see in the daytime and after that uh, and photosphere is the part is the lower part of the atmosphere from here the atmosphere of the sun starts and after that we have chromosphere and after that there is a sandwiched layer between chromosphere and the outermost layer of the uh, sun that is corona so that that region is called transition region so all these parts are very much interesting and the physics in all these zones are very interesting so if we study sun then we can get the knowledge of sun type stars existing in our universe so the atmosphere part is very uh, for a like uh, if we consider one example if we are sitting near a heater then we will feel very hot if we go away from the heater then we will feel cold 
but in case of sun once you move out from core you will be feeling cold but once you reach up to corona then you will you will be feeling hot again and that is the billion dollar question in the community that why the corona being so far from the core is still hot it's around million degree kelvin temperature but at the photosphere you have some th the temperature of thousand order so this is one of the base one of the question that everybody is trying to understand so these are the uh, uh, i mean uh, config uh, these are the structures uh, these are the layers of the sun that we have uh, studied till now so this is a fundamental nuclear fusion pro fusion process which is uh, or the pp chain reaction which was discussed yesterday is the source of energy for the sun and the important of Uh, to the important to study the sun is the presence of magnetic field so if we go to this slide so we can see a black patches here these magnetic these are called sun spots or the patches black patches on the solar atmosphere so these patches are black compared to compared to to their surroundings so these spots are the magnetic field these spots the magnetic field are very concentrated they have very high value like 1000 gauss so if we uh, recently we just discussed that uh, the comparison of magnetic field strength about neutron stars and earth and if we consider the magnetic field strength of these sunspot they are around 1000 gauss 1000 gauss or more than 1000 gauss we can find so these sunspots are very important as they play major role in shaping the dynamics in shaping the plasma dynamics or gas dynamics in the atmosphere of the sun this magnetic because of this presence of these magnetic fields we see different type of features on the solar atmosphere so like the, here the uh, some information about the magnetic uh, the sunspots so also uh, yeah so if we see the solar features so these are called some Uh, the the first one is uh, this hanging part is called the prominence which is hanging on the solar atmosphere they are consider this uh, they are, why we can see them because of the plasma content in the magnetic field so there is one uh, theorem is called alvin flux freezing theorem so according to that theorem what it tells that magnetic field lines and the plasma they will be uh, uh, binding with each other as long as there is no disturbances uh, disturbances in the system you can think of like an abacus so think like the rod of the abacus is magnetic field line and the bits in the abacus are the plasma particles so as long as you are not disturbing the rod attached with the bits then the bits will not be disturbed so that that is the main concept of flux freezing theorem so you see mostly these prominences they are tied the plasma particles are tied with the magnetic fields and they are hanging around the atmosphere sometimes they erupt so when they erupt that is a tension to us the space weather or what we call a geo effectiveness we experience the geo effectiveness so these are also when we see these prominences on the lean side of the sun we are, this is called as prominences but when we see on the deep center they are called filament channels so when these prominences are filament channels this is uh, these prominences or filaments are expelling from the sun almost every time but when they are coming towards the earth they can they can affect the life on earth they can affect the interst interstellar medium also they can affect the martian atmosphere also so because and that part also the solar wind which was discussed earlier the solar wind is also affecting the life on earth so if we can see one movie here uh, yes so this is uh, from one telescope one space based telescope so uh, so this part yeah so look at the this yeah some eruption is going on and the sun is occulted by the occulter of the telescope and again again it something is going out these are called the cme cme eruption if they are coming towards us on earth then it can affect the magnetic field surrounded by the earth that is the magnetosphere can be affected by this plasma particles or the magnetic field line associated with it 
also uh, the inter uh, another can, can yes, you sorry? just uh, uh, yeah. can you just tell uh, why uh, do why we need do to cover the sun cover the sun why do we need to cover the sun yeah, okay in, because yeah, the yeah 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 because uh, the otherwise what we can't see is the because the background the photosphere you will, you are going to see if we if we you, you want to study the eruptions from the sun you cannot see on the very brightened background that is your lower atmosphere that's why you need to occult that part so that you can see these uh, the surroundings of this uh, corona that's why you need so basically to occult the brightened like brighten part yes. uh, that, yeah. uh, that, so it's like the photons that we we'll get from the from atmosphere the of the sun it's, it's, it's very faint uh, the background the photosphere which is the surface of the sun it's very bright so that's why we see this corona during total solar eclipse in a much better way that's how you see those uh, very nice helmet streamer kind of structures uh, during total solar eclipse when the moon occults the center part of the sun which is the surface that's how we see so this is one of such instruments which is which has a artificial occult so it occults it uh, uh, uh stops the light which was coming from the surface and then we see just the corona i mean just the atmosphere of the sun that's how you see such eruptions and other things which are going on these are very dynamic in nature and uh, uh, they have very severe effects on uh, the, our space weather environment so it's a, a really interesting and important to study uh, those these sort of dynamics which was discussed in a very uh, detailed manner in one of the talks uh, in asi uh, by prantika bomik Uh, where uh, she uh, tried to understand and predict how this uh, periodic behavior like uh, the sun spots uh, the magnetic activity uh, cycle of the sun which is uh, roughly around uh, 12 11 to 10 to 11 years so how uh, they change and uh, uh, what can be done in terms of uh, physical our physical understanding and uh, using models and how can uh, we predict in future that uh, how the space environment is going to be in uh, the next cycle next solar cycle or so uh this was one of the interesting discussions uh, yesterday that uh, we followed and uh, there are several other discussions where uh, uh, we understood something about a, the coronal uh, heat there problem. is a disturbance somewhere uh, uh so one of us may do we do, do any of us have the youtube also on uh, or uh, uh, somiranjan you are speaking right so rest of us we will mute yeah. our microphones for now yeah. Oh, and okay. that okay. Right. It's, it's anyway got better atna i think it's fine now uh-huh. yeah but yeah so we are running out was... of time so i'm sorry i need to yeah it's... yeah okay Yeah, also, so, the, so the, in summary, so it's important to study uh, because the most of the energy that we uh, get from the sun, it's important for the habitability on Earth. So we really need to understand how our nearest star, our sun, is behaving in terms of magnetic field evolution, in terms of giving out energy, in terms of giving giving out uh, the solar irradiance, and uh, that is what is uh, going on in terms of research in the. community and uh, we are trying to understand this based on simulations based on observations with different telescopes both on ground based and uh, with space based uh, telescopes and uh, there is one interesting mission which is coming up uh, that is aditya l1 which it will be uh, uh, hopefully launched in 2021 uh, by this is a isro mission and we expect to see very interesting things uh, with that uh, telescope uh, the space based telescope Uh, the different layers of the sun and also uh, some magnetic field activity in the solar corona as well so that is what now uh, was discussed uh, in the asi meeting uh, earlier today and also uh, yesterday uh, so in fact we'll be really hearing nice about uh, this mission uh, tomorrow again yeah in one yeah. of the discussions yeah. yes also there is another indian mission uh, that is from that will be a ground based mission uh, so that is uh, national large solar telescope Uh, that will be yeah. compl- that will be on mirac side uh, in himalayan range so that is also another indian mm, yeah uh, one of project. the largest uh, in, yeah. solar yes, yes, in the yes, world solar yeah. so yes so there are also recently now i mean those are international missions like solar orbiter or parker solar probe so they will be investigating also these things So, so the fun is uh, the, the 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 for observation of the sun the fun is like we are very close to our star, uh, star and uh, we have very when I mean, the means of observing our nearest star is 
extremely i mean it's uh, available throughout uh, the day or night we can uh, observe it from the um, the ground we can observe it from the uh, uh, space mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, study with different modules and our uh, physics based understanding that how it is it uh, going to behave and what is the what what it is uh, which is driving this evolution so it's yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. Thanks for walking us through that. And we are going to have a full yeah. session sometime yeah. where we will ask sure, uh, sure, sure. you all to uh, come up with small quantitative projects which the participants can take up. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just, just uh, I mean, so any small quantitative experience. Yeah. Sure, so sure, thanks sure. so much. That was thank uh, you. Yeah. Thank you. Lovely. Shall we move and, to the next? Uh, yes, yes. And uh, Neeraj has uh, not joined. In yet. I see Manonita is there. Manonita. Yeah, there. Manonita and Mamta, Manonita. you wanted to tell us about uh, the uh, uh, the sunspot and uh, the more recent up upgradation of the Leighton Bobcock model. Lovely talk yeah. that was, and you wanted to summarize that talk, which helps us understand why how sunspots are in their systematics. And yeah. uh, so, uh, Sushri, I, if you, I, uh, screen, I share, screen share, yeah, so okay, I can, I, I, can, I can take care of okay. it, no problem, no problem. Okay. And uh, Mamta, so far, uh, what you wanted to speak, I should uh, share my screen. I, I have got your presentation, so let me just, just do that. Yeah, sure. And uh, so, and you are... Um, going to <coughs> yeah oh, sorry where is it just give me a minute uh yeah you 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 could get started mamta i'm just just trying to put that yeah. in as soon as i find that i i have too many things open and i'm not able to find where i have opened your presentation yeah. oh my goodness so Mamta, you can start. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, start. I, I can share my screen if, if that's... Uh, yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah, do that. Uh, for some so, reason... Do I need uh, to uh, no. stop sharing? Or? Uh, yeah, oh, I, I have taken it out of the active window, so there's no it, problem. All it, all it, all it. Thank you, thank you. So once Mamta, you share, I will add it. Sorry, you sent it to me and I have it here, but somehow I'm not it's able to It's just that it. there are so yeah. many interesting talks. <laughs> and uh, trying to you know summarize <laughs> and uh, get an overview of everything it becomes difficult in such a yes. large meeting definitely uh, that's that's right uh, yeah just just give me a second i will just share my screen why am i not able to see this in the share else i will have to share my whole screen i can do that because somehow I'm not able to find this tab. I know. I think Mamta will manage, right? Mamta, it will be. Yeah, I'll, I'm just sharing my screen. Just, just give me a. She's doing it right now. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oops. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, what's happened? Uh, one minute. Uh, okay, I, uh, I don't see. Me... I don't see yours, but mine has come. Mine has that. Okay. I have kept it. Mamta, you this can is... go ahead. Are, are you able to see? Yeah. Yeah. I'm able to see. I'll just point out when uh, you need to move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. So I'll be basically giving an overview of the talk given today morning at the plenary session by Dr. Vidya Binayak uh, Karak at Indian Institute of uh, Technology, VHU Varanasi. So basically, he talked about the recent developments in the Webcorp like light and solar dynamo theory. So uh, can you just go to the next slide? Is it okay? 
yeah just the next slide yeah that's one so uh, basic questions the fundamental questions that he wanted to answer in the in today's session i have just taken the snippets from his talk and in the right panel you can see the speaker uh, so what he wanted to answer was the following that uh, how does the sun produces the magnetic uh, cycles so basically what is the problem here is the following that if we observe the solar cycles in the sun as pointed out uh, the sun spots in the sun as pointed out by shushri in the previous discussion that you see sun spots and the sun spots on the surface of the sun have a regular period of 11 years so kind of they repeat the cycle gets repeated that is if you see this lower plot this plot is the number of sun spots versus the time so you can see that there's a periodicity where you see that number of sun spots are kind of repeating after a period of approximately 11 years and the number is although not constant but the cycle kind of repeats so this gives us an idea that the magnetic field in the sun follows a cycle of 11 years and the complete cycle is of 22 years going from the if you can imagine it like a sine wave so the complete sine wave is kind of 22 years long so the question that uh, Vidya wanted to answer today was are these following that how does sun produces a magnetic cycle the second question he addressed was why is the cycle not regular in the sense that you sometimes see more number of spots sometimes you see less number of spots in a given cycle and the third one is that why the sun produces the events like mandare minimum so the kind the of event you see over here that with the, all the number of sun spots almost go below 50 this kind of event is called the uh, mandare minimum so he want he also addressed this question in his talk and the next one is uh, can we make the prediction about the future cycles so these were the fundamental questions that were answered in the talk in the morning uh, ratna shri uh, next slide yes. please Okay, uh -huh. so the underlining Maybe idea. A little smaller, yeah. Yeah, so the underlining idea behind the pr uh, production or the uh, cycle, the solar cycle, why they are produced like this is the following: that if you have a, if the, you see, if this is the sun's uh, surface, and on the sun, uh, we have differential rotation of the plasma of the sun, I, I, the particles or the fluids present in the sun or the gas you can call it so this equator is rotating faster as compared to the poles so the magnetic field lines if they were earlier in the polar direction with the differential rotation they'll get stretched and they will kind of produce this kind of behavior that they are going to stretch in the the equator moves faster so the magnetic field lines moves along with it this is kind of an implication of the flux freezing theorem also stated just a while ago so and it produces the poloidal magnetic field that is the magnetic field lines are now aligned along the equator this is called the alpha effect then since the temperatures and the plasma in the sun is quite more um, there's a turbulence it's a turbulent medium so the field lines kind of get twisted and the toroidal magnetic field lines get back to the poloidal magnetic field lines and the, this is called the alpha effect that we have in the picture as far as the terminology of the dynamo effect goes. So this cycle of going from the polar magnetic field to toroidal magnetic field and back to polar magnetic field kind of gives the magnetic cycle. That's the overall picture. I mean, a rough sketch of the picture or I mean, it's a very simplified sketch, I would say, of the picture of the solar cycle. Uh, can, can we move to the next slide, please? Okay, so uh, now I've uh, explained this cycle approximately that the poloidal gets differential rotation, you get toroidal and then you get back to the poloidal. So how are sunspots formed? They are kind of the magnetic field lines because of buoyancy rise above the surface of the sun. And you see these uh, spots over here which are kind of the black and white represent that your pole of the magnetic field lines is coming out and going inside the surface of the sun. So the idea behind these uh, is the following. I'll come back to this slide a little while after a while. First, I'll explain the properties that the author wanted to explain. Can you move to the next slide? 
Okay. So the next thing that they wanted to take into account is the latitude variation of the sunspots. So as you see, this is the butterfly diagram. This is called the butterfly diagram. This is again the number of sunspots versus the time. However, it gives us that how many sunspots are present at a given latitude in the sun. So if you see, as you go on in the time, the number of sunspots present at higher latitudes increases and then it kind of goes down, right? And this also has a similar effect on the total number of sunspots that are happening if you see in the lower plot. So this is an older plot of 2018 and this is a, a recent plot of 2017, not so recent, but recent than the earlier one. So they have mapped the uh, peak of the sunspot versus the mean latitude at that particular uh, cycle. So they, these, uh, these are quite tightly correlated to each other, which gives us an idea that may, uh, possibly these cycles are related to the latitude variation of the magnetic field lines also. So Ratnashri, can we go back to the previous slide now? Yeah, thank you. So the authors kind of explained this kind of latitude variation of the sunspots coming from these. Uh, this was an animation, but I could not get the animation video here. So I'll just explain it from this figure uh, with the blue and red dots over here. So if you see these uh, blue and red dots, and if you imagine that a differential rotation is happening, so these blue and red dots will kind of get stretched along the equator. So as the sun is rotating and is completing one cycle and the solar sunspots keep on generating, there's an effect such that you have a residual pol polar magnetic field at the poles. And depending upon the polarity of these sunspots that we have over here, these magnetic field lines that we have over here, the magnetic field strength at the poles starts developing. That's a residual magnetic field, which kind of gives a latitude variation in the uh, sunspots. So that was one of the results that they explained. Can we go to the next slide, please? And this was also the, the, the effect that I explained just now, the latitude variation and the poloidal and toroidal magnetic field was also uh, the Bacock and Lightman effect. And Bacock and Lightman effect has one more, uh, one more consideration into picture in there that if you have a strong cycle at hand and then you in that case you'll have a weak if you have a stronger cycle your latitude uh, the number of sunspots that you have are at higher latitude that means you have a weaker pol polar field in that region when you go to the next cycle because you have a weaker polar field you'll have a weaker toroidal field also because if you see the first picture the polar field gives rise to the toroidal field Right. So you have a yeah. weaker toroidal field at the next cycle and next cycle would be a weaker cycle as a consequence. So that was also one of their implications that, that if you have a cycle maxima, then it goes on decreasing later on. Uh, can we move to the next slide, Ratnashri, please? Uh, Mamta, sorry to interrupt, but you have a minute more, half a minute. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll be done in a minute. So the next thing that they wanted to do was the following, that they wanted to predict the number of cycles happening, okay, and that they related it to the fact that you uh, we saw a very beautiful picture of the sunspot going with the latitudes, but you have a kind of scatter also present in the inclination of the sunspots present. The sunspots were inclined. There's a law called uh, Joyce law, which says that the tilt of the sunspot mm. is 32 times the sign of the latitude. However, if you see the observations from the previous uh, cycles, previous uh, few cycles that we have, you see a tilt, but you see a scatter around the mean tilt also. The mean tilt is around 8 degrees, and then you have a scatter around that tilt. That scatter, if taken into account in the dynamo picture, gives us the variation in the number of sunspots that we have every cycle. Let's just go to the next picture that illustrates this, uh, the results for these, this. Yeah, so that's the mostly, that's mostly the last slide. So if you have no scatter and you kind of uh, do the dynamo simulation, you get these as the number of sunspots happening every cycle. As soon as you start incorporating the scatter in the tilt of the sunspots, 
that it starts building up the number of cycles starts building up so from here they kind of predicted the next solar cycles also uh, so i'll just go to the concluding slide of the author let's go to the last slide from here yeah this this just shows us that how they predicted the next solar cycle happening so their idea is now with these calculations they can probably predict the solar cycle 2 to 3 years before it is happening which is a major uh, increment in our addition to the prediction predictions let next is just the concluding slide by the author we can just slash that yeah so tilt tilt quenching and latitude variation kind of gives a uh, non uh, two potential <coughs> candidates in their in the dynamo process that they had scatter gives us the idea about how the variation in the solar cycles is happening and they kind of they could also predict the solar number of sun spots happening yeah so i'll stop over here and maybe we can take a few questions uh let me just yeah so uh let me see because when when uh, yeah the screen share was there i could not see the studio there are questions uh yeah, sure. arvind wants to know has the next cycle started and when the next maxima is expected the uh, next cycle has started then yeah it's actually cycle started yes started, but yes. uh -huh. Uh, I I have only up to 2020. Right? Yes, yes, 19, 9, yeah, 19 December it started. So maximum will be around 25 or yeah, yeah, something like that. Yes, yeah. nine. Yes, we started yes. around the previous uh, year back or so. Yeah. So an Acharya is asking: Is there any scope for common people or citizen scientists participate to detect? So that's radio bird. Radio bird. Sri Harsh has already gone. Ah, uh, and he's 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 in fact participating in many citizen scientist uh, projects, like uh, Zooniverse and many of the others. And yeah, actually, we should probably have. I mean, we have the rad at home here, and but we, I mean, in uh, other areas also, it would be nice if we uh, have. accessible ones like this of course there are many 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 colleges and yesterday we heard that wonderful talk from balchandra joshi which allows undergrad students to go and do uh, rigorous radio astronomy but uh, online accessible like one. universe online accessible like universe or so it would be nice if uh, we all yeah. i mean everyone will put in some thoughts and having this so so one uh, another uh, solar related I, I, question parvin has put do the magnetic flux i just, just, just wanted to mention to soan though yeah. that uh, be there with us on national science day when aruveri and chetan uh, they are uh, doing hands on x-ray astronomy so that is one of those yeah what is arvin's question now do i am not able to read yeah? yeah i i'm i'm able to see uh, can i answer arvin's question yeah, yeah. yeah. yes yes yeah. yes Yeah, so uh, Arvind is asking, do magnetic poles flip north and south? And yes, they do flip, and that is why you have a complete. Uh, I explained in the beginning that you have a kind of a sign. Twenty-two years cycle. Twenty-two oh. years is the complete uh, time period for magnetic one cycle. cycle. Yes. Any? And, uh, yeah, it, it was. Uh, I mean, uh, Mamta, that all those complications of the butterfly diagram and those complexities of all those variations. could all come out of the simulations and just yeah so it is really nice that they have uh, presented and i kind of i enjoyed the session pretty much in the morning so by uh, that's why i messaged you that i'll part i'll particularly yes, like yes, to talk yes. about it's a very exciting <laughs> very nice yes. and uh, 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 i can joined? just make a comment uh, over yeah, here yes, please. about yes, please. the need of uh, modeling these uh, solar cycles so as uh, in the previous talk uh, it was already mentioned and even in this talk about the solar cycle so whenever you have solar maximum you have lot of uh, sun spots and that time you have lot of uh, cmes lot of solar flares mm -hmm. which can affect the satellites astronauts and our power grids communication systems at higher latitudes mm -hmm. so solar maximum is uh, yeah it is a uh, you can say a bit it can be a bit harmful so it is important to know the behavior during solar maximum that is true but it is also important to know the behavior of the sun during solar minimum because the previous solar minimum it was a very quiet one an extended one 
and there were like in 2008 there were more than 200 days when there was not a single sunspot on the sun so although it sounds uh, better that uh, sun is quiet and not uh, you know giving out uh, those uh, harmful cmes or solar flares but it can pose its own challenges so because of this situation the atmosphere of the earth it contracted because uh, the high energy radiation was not there and because of that contraction the low earth uh, orbit satellites which are there so uh, low earth orbit satellites generally have a lifetime of something like a few years and after that they are decommissioned or they uh, break up and when the atmosphere it at uh, till higher uh, height they automatically get uh, you know decayed the orbits get decayed because of the atmospheric drag and you need not worry about the space debris but when the atmosphere contracted so these debris took much longer to decay and they sustained in the orbit for much longer duration so it can pose a challenge when you know you have too many satellites so solar minimum is also important yeah so that kind of also gives us an idea that how we we if we need to simulate the orbits for the complete lifespan of the cycle so it gives us a lot of idea about that also okay. right right i'm going back to sovan's uh, uh, a request and then i actually forgot to mention uh, priya is with us and priya and najam have been doing this long series of possibilities of doing astronomy with archival data so when you should look up all of those uh, i think astronomy with archival know. data huh? he was there in the in the i think oh. are you aware of it uh. Hmm. Hmm. So, when, if not, do look it up. But yeah, your point about kind of you know continuous online thing is something maybe we will. Uh, yeah. Maybe POC committee can uh, have yes, its yes, own I recommendation think. in this direction. Yes. Yes. That yes. People I are think, interested in this kind of activities, and we should be coming up with something. Yes. That's right. That's... Okay. So uh, since uh, uh, I think we are going to have Neeraj joining us, perhaps. in tomorrow session so uh, we have in fact then today we are been so good about time <laughs> so yesterday it was the first time when it was decided like uh, uh, yeah 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 uh, yeah, yeah that's uh, in that's quick right. time so yeah yes. we had ex- yesterday's experience so my job was to basically stop everyone all the time <laughs> but today of course we have uh, one one session we are not doing so we probably would have yeah, overshot awesome. right now yes. we are on the shot by 3 minutes so if there are any inputs or any questions we could do that before we wrap up and uh, and this uh, broadcast manonita would you also like to come in i just had a big question oh, yeah. uh, uh, i probably think it's mostly answered but still just to clarify uh so for this uh, solar sunspots is it directly very cool or uh, related with the solar storms because i have seen some papers where it shows that there can be very strong solar storms during the solar minima as well so exactly. what is this dependence can um, uh, okay uh i'm not uh, directly connected to the the solar storm uh, field to answer the question exactly uh, but yes they are correlated with each other and the picture that we saw in the previous talk by sushri is showing the winds coming out of the uh, coronal region of the sun actually gives us an idea about how much solar storms do we have at that given particular time and they kind of also can see, measure the strength of the storms and the winds coming mm-hmm. out of the east we, we are again having a disturbance oh sorry i should have no we could hear you okay. mamta but there was some disturbance there is okay. one question but uh, somewhat kind of you know it isn't uh, any of the things which we have discussed uh, at least not area 51 whatever that is and uh, so i have no clue about dicing we will <laughs> will pass that will pass that will pass that for now yeah, probably we will uh, pass the question and maybe try to answer in the tomorrow session uh, if, if we have uh, and uh, just to add to uh, yeah. what uh, mamza ji already said uh, so uh, about this question uh, that manunita said uh, is there uh, like there are uh, stronger uh, storms even during solar minimum so actually uh, uh, generally the stronger storms are there when 
the sun yeah, is more active but yeah, you have a max we have seen decently strong not very strong uh, storms but decently strong storms when uh, it is relatively quiet period also or solar minimum conditions but one reason why we see uh, a more uh, you know sort of uh, i would say decent storm is there are two reasons first it's uh, not only related with uh, whether it's just solar maximum or solar minimum there are many other parameters so for example mm-hmm. one parameter is what is the direction of the interplanetary magnetic field or basically the direction of the magnetic field uh, that is embedded within the coronal mass ejection so if it is like opposite to the orientation of earth's magnetic field so reconnection can happen and the then a lot of energy can be dumped so in that case you will see a severe storm but if the magnetic field directions are parallel so in that case uh, reconnection is not possible and that energy dumping will not happen so that is one factor another one factor is that during the solar minimum conditions your overall background conditions are very quiet so it's like uh, you know uh, the sea is very quiet and you have you know very small uh, waves so if there is a even moderate size uh, size wave you can clearly say it okay just to give an analogy but if it is like a very rough sea a moderate size wave will not be seen only when you a strong wave comes you will be able to see that so it is something similar to that Yeah, uh, just uh, one part like the solar storms like when they are uh, sailed uh, on earth that is they are called as geo uh, magnetic storm geo magnetic storm so also yes, yes. and also uh, like uh, uh, like a uh, uh, what uh, birendra ji said so when uh, and there is a scale for measuring that so that is called uh, dst uh, that is some storm index you have to yeah disturb uh, storm time index yes. disturbance yeah storm time index so when the and for that you need the like he said the southward component of magnetic uh, bz component bz only the when it it will be uh, i mean when it will be like more towards us then the reconnection rate will be more and the dst index of what you will measure at earth will be more so that's how uh, you define that how stronger it is then and also there are different studies like for uh, comparison comparison of cycles in cycle 24 in cycle 25 which one is more active and how the storms are also com- i mean behaving on based on the activities that that are seen in solar atmosphere so there are also studies on that cycle like 24 25 based on the availability of uh, satellite data yeah. so an- another factor in fact is the orientation of the uh, magnetic field lines i mean not only uh, in the cme cloud but if, so for example uh, it is seen in some of the studies that you have uh, more severe storms during the equinox periods that is when whenever there are equinoxes on earth so that has something to do with uh, the orientation of the earth's magnetic field lines and when you know day night terminator gets more aligned with the uh, magnetic field lines so that happens during the equinoxes and that's at that time uh, this energy dumping process is more effective so this is another factor it, it's kind of quite a complicated process that we have to do yes 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 yeah. another quick question if you could yeah. answer yeah, is how much the aurora effect is affected by, uh, by this the so aurora actually this is the exact reason for aurora so uh, so what happens so is, if uh, uh, i mean if you permit me i can just uh, share one uh, movie uh, while birendra ji can explain on background yeah. so yeah yeah i, I had that actually uh, just one minute yeah mm-hmm. go ahead yeah, uh, we can we can you know so Aurora yeah yeah yes yeah uh, the cme uh, is emitted from the sun it will travel through the uh, interplanetary space and uh, it encounters other planets also like mercury venus but there there is no magnetic field so it doesn't cause aurora over there yeah but, but so you see it encounters the, in the uh, planets later in the orbit like saturn and yeah, jupiter yeah so jupiter and yeah. saturn because they have the magnetic fields Yes. so yeah so here this animation shows that uh, this uh, cme or coronal mass ejection is emitted from the sun and then it is traveling uh, through the interplanetary uh, sphere and this is the earth earth's magnetic sphere the cme impact uh, impacts the earth's magnetic sphere and because of the impact it drags the magnetic field away uh, 
with the flow. So the magnetic field lines go towards the night side, and then and they break. Then, then here you see a lot of these particles getting into the atmo upper atmosphere of the Earth. So when they enter the upper atmosphere of the Earth, they interact with the atmospheric particles, and they impart their energy to these atmospheric species of the Earth. And due to that energy transfer, they go to the excited state, but they cannot remain there. And so they de-excite and they emit this radiation. And that radiation is seen in the form of auroras. Yeah, and the particles kind of are traveling along the field lines, and that is why we see them near the poles. That is yeah, yeah. happening. Yeah, in, in a, uh, not yeah. exactly at the pole, slightly away. So in, in a shape of sort of oval, yeah, it's called a, auroral uh, oval. And depending yeah. upon how uh, strong your uh, storm is, this oval can shift to lower and lower latitudes. So in exactly. fact, uh, when the strongest geomagnetic storm on record occurred uh, in 1859, the Carrington storm. So at that time, it is the DST index was the min, uh, like basically the DST index goes negative. So more negative means that uh, the, there is a more severe storm. So at that time, uh, so usually if you have something like minus 200, minus 250, it is a strong storm. During the Carrington event, it is estimated that the uh, value was something like minus 1600. So it was the absolutely uh, severe storm. And unfortunately, at that time in India, it was the monsoon period. So there were, uh, you know, thick clouds. So most likely, Aurora was not seen. But few years later, there was another uh, such very strong storm, not so severe as Carrington event. But uh, the second time, the DST was something like uh, minus nine, nine, 900 or something like that, or minus 1000. And that time, Aurora was seen even in Mumbai. And uh, if you search older records, you'll find a clipping from Times of India newspaper where they have described this, that the Aurora was seen in Mumbai. So it is uh, such a low latitude. Also, mm -hmm. like yeah. in uh, just one another yeah. event uh, that happened in uh, Quebec, Canada. So uh, yeah, yeah. 1980, some nine something. Or, 89, 89. So, yeah, I think for some days, uh, the Quebec entire province uh, yeah, yeah. went so, blackout. So. Yeah, the transformers and power grids were mm. overloaded. So transformers yeah. got burned. So it so took some time. They, to, uh, yeah. That's the sun earth connection. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. And uh, uh, we are so, kind of lucky that we are just uh, closer to each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Arvind uh, has been mentioning counting sunspots as uh, one citizen scientist project too. So if there is, I mean, if there is uh, a pro project where uh, from maybe some of these spacecraft or other professional ones, images are there and do it or Arvind, you meant from our own. So that would be a learning kind of activity, which which is possible if we do it with our own simple telescopes. But if there are data available for citizen scientists to take part in it, yes. Yes, and, data uh, is available from STO, a solar dynamics observatory. Yes, yes. The magnetic field data is open, so one can... Uh -huh. But white light it. images, are they kind of one a day or so, or more frequent white light images are there or any of these other... Uh, uh, Apart from, right. uh, there there was some place called Sun Now, which used to give H alpha images. As, I mean, I saw, but uh, white light. Kind of, you know, all that. But uh, ha ha, yeah. The thing is that for uh, kind of you know like beginners who are looking at it, if so, th I was seeing that there are images available on a daily basis or so for kind of popular consumption. But um, more frequent. Yeah, Spaceweather.com is one uh, website where. No, which such gives a, us daily, uh, daily. Yeah, daily. yeah, daily images are available. But also I guess so there... SDO will have more frequent images available online. Uh, yeah, more frequent, frequent images are there, yeah. but uh, they may not be in a very, uh, you know, uh, uh, very non-technical uh, format, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, may not be very yeah. uh, general audience friendly. We so, should do a workshop then for yeah, uh, maybe, so maybe we can have the, uh, or yeah. we can plan something. Heliovir so. also, I would uh, I would recommend Heliovir also. You just put the date and you can uh, see the observation from their different channels of HDO yeah, and okay. also there are different instruments. So one can see Heliovir or solar monitor. They can you can just put the date and you can look for that. But we'll definitely continue this to uh, having some kind of workshop where students can yeah, yeah, do something, can, quantitative, something. something quantitative. Uh, in fact, I <laughs> already have got something in uh, 
uh, my mind uh, based on uh, some things i uh, became aware of uh, very recently so it seems that uh, you know very uh, old data almost like 100 year data has been uh, digitized which used to be in chart forms uh, you know uh, from the kodaikanal uh, solar observatory and maybe we can think of something uh, like uh, more citizen science uh, friendly format uh, to you know uh, do some sort of uh, activities out of that so maybe i'll i'll talk to the people who are yeah. involved with that and maybe we may be able to come up with something so i think we are ready to wind up today it was lovely yeah. wonderful all of you who were there today yesterday i hope we will continue these sessions ahead yes, yes. Tomorrow, yes. converting them into you know like one topic one session and then uh, having something hands on not hands on but little more serious than hands on mm -hmm. some quantitative explorations which people can do so thank you everyone thank you for all of you who were there um, there is an echo from my side so i think so i think yeah yeah okay, okay. then thank you everyone okay, then thank, thank you everyone, everyone. Thank you. okay thank you, everyone. bye bye, bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.